Hello and welcome to a video by The Rose System. I'm Sarah and today we are reacting to slash responding to Cinema Therapy's Split video. Full disclaimer, we have not watched Split, we are never going to watch Split, but we have a general understanding of its storyline. Needless to say, Split is an atrocious representation of DID. So this is more of a response to what Jonathan and Alan say. This video is not scripted, so you will be dealing with the umming and ahhing that comes with my thoughts being a mess. Cinema Therapy is a channel I found before I knew I was a DID system. I thoroughly enjoy this channel and I love hearing from both a therapist's opinion as well as someone in the movie making industry. We have left the information for this channel in the description below and in the card up above. Please check them out, they are great. Let's get into it. Here, mental illness leads to murder and cannibalism and all sorts of terrible things. So not accurate. We're gonna go to town on this. Okay. Destroy it, it needs to be destroyed. And welcome to Cinema Therapy. I'm Jonathan Decker, licensed therapist, and I take my fashion cues from the PGA Tour. Uh, <laughs> I'm Alan C. Wright, professional filmmaker, and I need therapy. And I am Sarah. <laughs> I would like to apologize in advance for half cutting off Alan's face. I tried so many different positions for the avatar and background, and none of them were working. So this is the best we've got. Apologies. <laughs> yes, and so today is our villain therapy series. We're going to be exploring Kevin Wendell Crumb and his 24 other personalities from the film Split, otherwise known as How Not to Do Dissociative Identity Disorder. At least not if you don't want to get cancelled. Wow! Okay, right out of the gate. <laughs> I bet you're gonna tell me not remotely close to real life. Not realistic and uh, grossly irresponsible. To grossly irresponsible. To the mental health community. That's always something you want to attach to yourself. <laughs> the amount of harm this film has done to people with DID is absolutely shocking. There are university professors and lecturers who use Split to teach their students about DID and going, this is a real and accurate representation of DID. It's revolting, absolutely revolting. You can enjoy Split as a movie, but it is a movie and we're going to pick the flesh off of its bones for how it does just a terrible number for the DID community. Yeah, a better representation of the DID community would be... Moon Knight. Moon Knight. Which we will be getting to. Stay tuned for that. Yeah. Who's going to look after us when you retire or pass on? You know, we're going to have to take care of ourselves. I love that he says us and we. He's referring to a whole yeah. system. If ever something We do it all the time. <laughs> so he's not Barry. He's, right. Which of the personalities masquerading is Barry? Right, so the term masquerading isn't quite used in the community. We call it masking. It's a little bit different to masking with autism. But masking in DID is when an alter, a personality, an identity, we call them alters, uh, when an alter is pretending to be another alter, usually the host, uh, usually the um, alter who is out the most frequently. Dennis. Right? Dennis. Yeah. Dennis is the one with the OCD. And she's and she's suspicious. She's well. picking up on it for sure. Really quickly, explain yeah. what is a DID system? Because you said yes, it's okay. a whole system. Well, and I the, a DID system is uh, the collection of alters, the collection of identities that live in the one body. I want to I want to approach something head on. So we did a DID Thank episode you. on Gollum from Lord of the Rings. Sure. Mm -hmm. And I got taken to task in the comments section and rightly so by our fans. And I want to some stuff. It was mostly I, good, but I missed some stuff. Yeah. And here's something that the scene gets right. The science behind all of this is constantly evolving. Yeah. Right. Sure. Because when we talk about dissociative identity disorder, when we talk about clinical depression, when we talk about anything, 
these are constructs used to describe a behavior right. and to hopefully prescribe some sort of treatment that is helpful. With dissociative identity disorder, you're dealing with what used to be called multiple personalities, right? Sure. But multiple identities living within one body. What I based that episode on was my education, my experience, and what I knew about the research. But here- I do have a question. When did you do your research? Um, are you up to date with the current theory surrounding DID? Or is this um, something you've done in the past and haven't had the time to update yourself on? Um, because I hear uh, you talk about the original, um, the original altar, the original identity. And from my understanding of the science currently is that that idea is outdated. Some systems do still prefer it, but there are a lot of systems who don't, ourselves included, who don't identify with there being an original altar. Um, yeah, so I'm just curious, uh, is DID something you've uh, been continually educating yourself on? Um, I could be wrong. I'm not a professional. Um, it's just something that's brought up curiosity for me. Here's the thing. We're now on the DSM-5, right? The, this is you were the, learning on the 4. Right? I was learning on the 4 because that's how old I am. We're on the DSM-5. My error was I said, here's what the studies say, and I didn't listen enough to the people who experienced it. Looking at it from a clinician, a clinician's always going to show up on a scene and say, my duty is to heal. It's to help. Right? And so we look at a problem and we look for a solution. And so many systems in our comments commented, there's nothing to heal. Yeah, we're good. We're good. We we're a healthy system. There's four of us and we're great. Yeah. Um, yeah, so this is known as functional multiplicity. It's generally a goal that a lot of systems have, especially initially. Uh, final fusion, which is when all the identities or the alters merge into one identity. Uh, is not achievable for a lot of systems, uh, particularly systems that have a large number of alters. Yeah, so functional multiplicity is generally the aim, especially in the beginning, and then some systems do decide to go on to pursue final fusion. We live in harmony together, we look out for each other. So they're hearing two voices, and so they're, they think there's two people in there. With dissociative identity disorder, this is known as switching, right? When when one We're here, Help us! We're when one here. personality is speaking, Don't is inhabiting. Don't go in there. Yeah, so switching is when the altar who is controlling the body changes. Uh, so uh, I can be fronting, which is when you control the body. It's known as fronting. Um, I will be fronting and then little A will switch with me and little A will then be fronting. One thing that you see a lot in movies that doesn't happen as much in real life is rapid switching or conversations between the two. Both happen. Uh, rapid switching is um, not too uncommon. Um, we experience it, a lot of systems we know also experience it. There's this um, inability for someone to hold on to the front, to hold on to controlling the body. And as I describe it, you just roll a deck through the altars um, until someone is able to hold it. But it's very, it doesn't always happen like that. As for the conversations between the two, our system doesn't experience it quite like this. Um, I've seen uh, other systems do it. Uh, for us personally, I will generally say my bit out loud and then listen uh, internally for the response to what I've said. James McAvoy, he's not just you know changing his voice and one or two mannerisms. His entire posture changes. The shape of his face yeah. changes because he's pulling with different muscles to do different things. So it's not just like that his expression is changing. Like he's resetting his jaw to different places, which will change the shape of your face and yeah. the set of how you look. 
like Patricia uh-huh. is very proper, yes. prim, and her, her chin juts forward just a little bit. And when he goes into Dennis, his jaw gets set back more, like his entire head moves back on the neck, and he furrows his brow a little bit. In one shot that is just living right here, where he changes from Barry to Dennis, it just sits on it for 45 seconds, and you 100% believe that two different people are in the same person. Yeah. So, I will give it to James McAvoy. He does play the system very well, kind of, aside from all the horrendous misrepresentation. But what was on screen just there is a very valid um, example of what a switch can look like. Uh, The way the littles hold their face compared to me is very different. Um, Apparently mist is quite terrifying when they front um, because of the way they hold the face and it's a completely different face structure to how I hold my face or how the littles hold their face. Um, And the mannerisms and the body language changes all do happen provided the system isn't masking. Um, So a lot of systems, the default is to mask, to pretend to be the host, the person that everyone knows. Um, So uh, the thing with systems, you will not know there's a switch if the system doesn't want you to know that there's been a switch. Um, so, and even in friendship groups, uh, not all systems are open about the fact that they're not, uh, the host. It changes from system to system as to how it's represented and how it goes. There's no cuts, there's no visual effects, there's no trickery, there's just James McAvoy being a goddamn hero. <laughs> It is phenomenal, and and psychologically speaking, that's something that the performance gets mm. right. Is that a DID system? They have it the same body, but they use that body completely differently. Yeah. One identity in an individual with dissociative identity disorder can have high cholesterol. One. There have been cases where one identity is allergic to bee stings; the others are not. Are there moments where two identities can coexist at the same time? There are times when two identities can take the light or the spot or consciousness at the same time. This happened. Not to my knowledge. So, um, stepping into the light known as fronting, two alters can be conscious uh, at the same time, conscious of the external world at the same time. This is known as being co-con. Uh, This is very common for systems that fall under the label of OSDD-1B. OSDD-1B isn't in the, um, the label OSDD-1B isn't in the DSM-5, it's just labeled as um, OSDD in the DSM-5. But what the community calls OSDD-1B is when the alters are distinct, but they're generally aware of what's happening in the external world um, at the same time. This also happens in DID systems. This is what most of my experience is when little a or little m is fronting. I'm generally, not always, but generally aware of what's happening, what they're doing, what's going on. Uh, So co-consciousness is definitely a thing and co-fronting, which is when two alters have control of the body at once, also a thing. Um, it's uh, something I've seen uh, with other systems and something that sometimes happens with us. So I will be, uh, I'll be sitting down and studying and being really absorbed in um, whatever reading I'm doing for uni and my three-year-old will come alongside me and stick my fingers in my mouth 
and I will finish reading the paragraph or the sentence or something and realize, oh, little miss three-year-old came and uh, as a way to self-soothe has put our fingers in our mouth. Yeah, so co-fronting and co-consciousness, very much a real thing. Uh, different systems will experience it on different levels. Uh, not every DID system initially has the ability for co-consciousness. Um, a lot of systems, it has to be uh, worked on and trained and improved upon. Uh, it comes quite naturally to us, which makes us a rare case. We're, we're taking notes in different handwritings about separate things at the same but time. But any systems watching who care to correct me or to say, no, that actually does happen, let me know. Yeah, we'd love to hear from as you. As much as the difference between... <laughs> so yes, I've responded. I decided to make a video instead of responding in the comments because if I responded in the comments, it would be an essay long. So hence why we're doing a video instead. So this is where we kind of get into the unbreakable universe. Sure. Because we're talking about extraordinary abilities. Yeah. Superhuman abilities. Individuals, through their suffering, unlocked the potential of the brain. So I talked about last time that it's very often linked to trauma, but not always. And whew, and and a lot of people said, no, it is always trauma. It is always linked to trauma. And, or, and some people said it is always linked to childhood trauma. That's where it happens. Uh, there is a very strong correlation. Okay. Strong enough for the community, just for, for your average person. It's basically a law. It's basically a law and you could, you could establish causality. Okay. The thing is, from my perspective, in the psychology community, you can establish strong correlations to the point where you can say, this seems causal, but we have to leave the door open for more information. Well, that's science, right? Exactly. Like, that's how science works. We know what we know. We don't know what we don't know yet. Exactly. And so I, I will say, and I'll correct my, my previous position on this, by all appearances, it is linked to trauma, specifically childhood trauma. Childhood trauma. trauma. Okay. But again, I'm not going to categorically say, and that's how it is, because that's not science. What... And that's fair enough. Um, like with anything scientific, you have to be open for new information. Um, and this raises the question of, um, when was the last time you did research on DID? Um, just out of curiosity. Because uh, from my understanding, the current theory is the theory of structural dissociation where in young children, um, the children, you know how children can go from happy to sad, to excited to angry within a split second, uh, these different states of being. And what, what the theory suggests is that in normal development without repeated trauma, uh, these different states of beings merge into one to form one identity. Uh, but what happens in the case of DID and OSDD is that these different states of being, amnesia barriers get put up between them, preventing them from forming into one and instead forming multiple. And then um, each of those separate identity states begin to develop their own personality, their own state of being. Um, so this is my current understanding of the current research. I'm not a researcher, I'm not a professional, um, but from my understanding that's the current theory and the current belief surrounding DID. Is it possible or plausible that one member of the system could, if you, if I had two members, one of them can bench press more than the other. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, but that's, that's just sports psychology, right? Like if you believe you can, you'll perform better, right? Correct. Right. Yep. But yeah, so this is a thing. Um, our three year old is nowhere near as strong as the rest of us. We had to carry a bag of books home and our three-year-old switched in and they struggled 
that could do it, but the book bag was ten times heavier than what it was when I was holding it. Um, yes, yeah, so the body does has limits, and this is where uh, the movie is inaccurate. Um, we don't climb walls. Um, but there is different abilities within uh, DID systems. Another example is driving. Um, some alters have the ability to drive, others do not. It depends on who was around when the body was learning to drive, who actually spent time behind the wheel as a learner driver. It's, um, it's quite fascinating looking at the different limitations that different alters have. Yeah. And, and this is where we get into a conversation about duty of the artist versus duty of the audience. Because if I'm the artist, I'm thinking, well, I'm clearly not saying this is how DID really is because I've got a monster that climbs on walls. This is obviously fiction, and the audience needs to understand that. And it's in a universe with a guy who is literally unbreakable, yeah. which is not a thing. <laughs> Science has established this. Any human that gets hit by a truck is going to go splat. What's your opinion on like responsibility of, of artists versus responsibility of audience? I, of course, am going to come down more on you know, duty of the audience. Like I, as an artist want to be able to tell the stories that I want to tell. Yeah. This is a great story. It's super fun. Uh, you have to go into it as an audience member thinking like, I'm going to a movie now. Yeah. I'm not going to a documentary. Even if I am going to a documentary, maybe the documentarian has an agenda that they're pushing, you know, like T-Rex's vision isn't actually based on movement. So question for those at home, because we're just having a conversation here. Like, please don't get upset with us if we took a position that's opposite from yours, because we really want to know duty yeah. of the artist versus duty of the audience. Where do you think the most responsibility falls and why? We want to hear from you. Do a comment. Or a video, in my case. I get where you're coming from, the duty of audience and the fact that it's up to the audience to realize that what, sh what they're watching is not based in reality. But there is this issue with mental health in particular and DID, where we're only seen as the villain, where we're only seen as the bad guy. That's the only representation we have in media. Moon Knight, is a rare exception to this and even Moon Knight is a struggle because you have alters who are willing to murder in Moon Knight. Yes, it's for the right reason, but they're still murdering people. Um, and I don't like that. Uh, United, Tate, United States of Tara the alters are just not depicted pleasantly. They're, they're not evil, but they're not pleasant people. Um, split. We're a horror trope. A split were used as a horror trope in uh, different FBI and uh, CIA type TV shows. Uh, where the murderer, where the... Um, we're just not represented in a positive light. And this, this is the issue that we have with uh, all the responsibility being put on the, um, the audience. When an audience is only exposed to DID being horror and being um, this trope for horror movies and you know where the murderer is it sends a message that is very hard to escape it sends a message that we are dangerous that every single system has a murderer and so whilst there is responsibility on the viewer there's also a responsibility on the content creator we're not a horror movie trope we are real we are broken, we are hurt. We are not monsters, we are hiding from the monsters. And it's not right 
that we are continually being portrayed as the evil one. We're continually being portrayed as a murderer and a cannibal and yeah, it's not right, it's messed up. There's so little good representation and so I'd push back and say there's a responsibility to be accurate and fair and not to fall into the stereotype and to accurately portray without the masquerading of, oh, this is a horror movie. There are people who don't believe the idea is real because they believe it only exists in horror movies because that's the only access to information they have. So yes, there's responsibilities on both sides, but I lean more towards content creators because even though you want to tell a story, it shouldn't come at the expense of an already vulnerable community. Hey guys, Sarah from the future here. Uh, I've been editing the video and it's quite long, even with us cutting out uh, decent chunks uh, so we're going to pause here and pick this back up next week um, stay tuned uh, we will get back into it i just want to say a big thank you to alan and jonathan for creating this video it's a really important talking point anyway we'll see you next week we'll see you in the next video where we will wrap up um this a mini series that it's turned into. Please know you are loved by the incredible God of the Universe, and we'll see you next week. Bye!